Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. We're going to jump into day two of testimony in the Alec Baldwin trial. But first, you know the drill. If you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Click that little bell icon. Music fact of the day. The song To Love Somebody by the Bee Gees was actually written for Otis Redding, but unfortunately, he passed away before getting a chance to record it. One bit of news. Hannah Gutierrez-Reed will be transported to the courthouse tomorrow, but she is expected to plead the fifth and not testify. She does have an appeal going on and court will start one hour later. I believe they're going to handle all that before the jury gets in. So we will see what happens there. I have to give a big thank you to Allie from Allie's Originals Studio for the cool vinyl earrings. I am working on a small business section on my website. Over the years doing this, I found out I've got some really creative alibiers. So thank you, Allie, and look for that section on the website, hopefully this weekend. That's my goal. When we left off yesterday, the crime scene tech, Marissa Poppel, was on the stand, and they actually finished up with direct, and she was on cross this morning, and it lasted most of the day, and it was pretty brutal. The defense starts out by questioning if the firearm was destroyed during the FBI testing, and the witness said it was broken. On the prop cart, she found the shell casing that housed the lethal projectile that killed Miss Hutchins. He tells the witness that Baldwin told you he cocked the gun but points out that she did not test the trigger of the firearm for fingerprints or DNA. She doesn't remember him telling her this about pulling the hammer back so the defense attorney shows her a transcript and asked if that refreshes her memory that Alec Baldwin told her he pulled back the hammer on that revolver. She does not recall the conversation but does not dispute that the conversation happened. Another question he asked is, do you know if his DNA was on the trigger of that firearm? And she does not. He asked if after speaking to Alec Baldwin on set, did she request to test the hammer? The witness says it was requested after talking to the lab and that request was for latent prints and DNA, but she does not recall specifically what all they were going to test on the firearm. He asked if she requested the testing of the hammer and she does not remember. They move on to talk about the prop cart, and he asked if someone moved things on the prop cart and if that would be a serious issue, and she agrees it would be. The defense says that the Starline Brass Rounds was the brand of live ammunition on the set that had a nickel primer. The defense speaks briefly about the theory of sabotage on set. That was something that was brought up at Hannah's trial. It was quickly dismissed. She wasn't sure if some rounds were live or dummies, so those were sent to the FBI for testing. As far as what live ammo was found on the set, there were two projectiles on the top of the cart with silver primers. There was one inside the box of ammunition that Hannah gave Lieutenant Benavides when he was on the scene. Alec Baldwin's gun holster had a live round as well as Jensen Ackles' gun belt. As far as the search warrant for the church, the defense says you got a copy of the script and the shot list. She thinks it was photographed, but not collected. He shows her a copy of this paperwork, and he has her read from the photograph, and it says, quote, Rust, Colt, cocked quietly now, end quote, which means that they were going to shoot Alec Baldwin's character quietly cocking back the hammer of the gun. Another sentence says, quote, Macro on hammer as thumb cocks it and frontal slow push on Rust his hat down motionless. The defense asked if she thought that that script and paperwork reflected what was happening in the scene. She said it contained the shot list and the script for the day, and there was mention of a firearm in the paperwork. The defense asked if it describes what Alex's character was doing, and she says yes. The defense asked if it confirms what Mr. Baldwin told her. She said she doesn't remember saying that, but she could have. And the defense asked if the paperwork is Miss Hutchins, and she thinks it was. One piece of paper was found in her bag, and another was found around where she fell after being shot. She tried to find the video recording from inside the church, but that shooting was not caught on film. The defense asked about live ammunition being found inside the church, and she said it was, and it was in Mr. Baldwin's bandolier. 
The defense points out there's no reason to believe he knew it was in there, and she agrees. Initially, she was unfamiliar with how ammunition works on a movie set, but researched it and kind of became the go-to with the sheriff's office to educate them on how it worked. She would attend meetings to explain how ammunition on set is used. And they talk about blanks being the crimped tip and the ones that go poof. They point out, as we know, some dummies look exactly like live ammunition. And those were on set as well. He asked if they were Seth Kinney's dummy rounds, and she said yes. A week after the shooting, they execute the search warrant on the prop truck, which houses that prop cart. We know now, on top of that prop cart, live ammunition was found. Seth Kinney was there during the execution of that search warrant on the prop truck. He opened the gun safe. She said he owned the safe and had the combination. The defense asked if she's sure about that. The defense did not elaborate after that, so I'm not sure where he was going with it. They talk about the number of actors on set, and a lot of the actors, unbeknownst to them, could have had live ammunition on their person. She agrees with that, and we know, again, Jensen Ackles was seen with live ammo on his gun belt. Inside that prop truck, there were boxes of ammunition. A lot of the boxes were the same, but he points out one box that looks different. It was handwritten and not stamped. She said Seth Kinney was the one that wrote on that box. Another photo shows an ammunition box with some ammo with Starline brass. Starline brass rounds have no gunpowder. And he asked if she knows where the rest of the bullets in this box was, and she doesn't. But none of them were live rounds. The defense asked if Seth Kinney came to the precinct to give her ammunition, and he did. She thought it was helpful, and the defense attorney asked if it made her suspicious, and she said it was not her place to be suspicious of that. The defense says what he turned in were two different types, the Starline brass spent shell casings and live ammunition with nickel primers that were not Starline brass. He asked if Seth Kinney would have been the one who provided the live ammunition to the set, it would be bad for him, and she said it would be bad for whoever provided that live ammunition that ended up on set. The defense says whoever provided live ammunition would have a reason not to be found out. He then moves on to the search warrant that took place at the PDQ warehouse, which is Seth Kinney's business. He asks why they executed the search warrant at night, and she doesn't know. He also points out nothing was done to secure the prop house before the search warrant. She said it took place a month and a week later. Seth Kinney was there when his place was searched and helped out. He asked about the organization of the prop house, and she said it was as equally organized as the prop cart. In other words, it was the Hot Mess Express. If you're looking on YouTube, you can see here, it just looks like a hoarder lives here. In the search warrant at PDQ, they were looking for a green ammunition can. She said at some point it did house live rounds. And at the time of that search warrant, Seth was a person of interest as far as being the one who provided the live ammo to the set. The day before... He provided ammunition to the Rust set. He had live rounds that were Starline brass nickel rounds from the 1883 set. 1883 is a prequel to Yellowstone, which I'm in the middle of, and it is a great series, by the way. He said, you told the jury when you compared the powder from the Rust set and Seth Kinney's, they were not the same. She says that's correct. He asked if she searched every box at PDQ, and she said yes. He asked if she ever found 45 caliber live rounds there. Yes. He says, you're saying if there was live ammo at the PDQ warehouse that matched, you would have found it? And she said yes. At this point, he throws up a photo of the Hot Mess Express PDQ warehouse house there's boxes stacked to the ceiling and he asked if they had a ladder when they were searching and she said no she said she believes those boxes were looked into it was not just her searching and he asked if she searched those boxes and she said they searched the entirety of the property and he asked what that means she said if a box is open and there's no ammo, then we're not going to dump the box out until rounds that are not in there fall out. She thinks they divided that one particular room between everybody to be searched. The defense asked if she's saying under oath she searched every box. And she says, not me personally, but we reasonably searched the property. And then she fires back and says, how would you approach searching this there's an objection. They also didn't use evidence markers there at PDQ Warehouse. The defense says, Seth Kinney said, I bet you $1,000 there's no 45 long Colt rounds in there. 
and he asked, did he win the bet? She said, no, there were some found in the bathroom. He asked if at any point she became suspicious of Seth, and she did not. They did find that green ammo container that said live ammo. He asked if she joked with Detective Hancock it was going to take forever to search every box, and she says she doesn't know but she also doesn't deny it. He asked if there were times she would pick up a box and just shake it. She says she can't recall, but again, doesn't deny it. The defense says you wouldn't be able to be sure if you just shook the box to be sure there weren't any live rounds co-mingled with dummies, and that's the entire case of what the armorer did, which is co-mingle live ammunition and dummies, and she said yes. He said at the search warrant, to find these live rounds, law enforcement is doing the same thing. They're complaining about the armor doing on set, and the witness says yes. He said, when you left that search warrant, are you sure you got every live round? And she said no. He said, if you look at the boxes in that location, you didn't search half of them? And she said she does not recall. Then he asked, well, why on direct, if you do not recall when the state asked, if you found every live round, you said yes? She said she believes she found every live round. The defense points out, you said you found every live round. She said, I believe a reasonable search was conducted. The defense asked, uh, so you didn't search every single box? And she said, no. The defense says now what you're saying is that you did a reasonable search. She says, yes. The defense says the other thing the search warrant asked you to take was surveillance cameras from the PDQ warehouse. Did you? She said no. He asked if they could have seen Seth Kinney disposing of live rounds in the 40 days between the shooting and the search warrant, and she said possibly. He asked, could it have shown prop master Sarah Zachary picking up things? Again, possibly. The defense points out they didn't take DNA, fingerprints, or Seth Kinney's cell phone. He said that she didn't answer how live ammunition ended up on the set, and she said she doesn't have evidence to show where it came from. He asked if she was trying just to get this done so the state could focus on Alec Baldwin, and she said no. The defense says you personally believe Alec Baldwin committed no crime. Is that true? And she says no. He asked if there's any evidence Alec Baldwin brought live ammunition to the set, and she said no. No evidence. He did. He said after all this, you, Detective Hancock, and the state asked the FBI to do the accidental discharge test, and she doesn't recall who asked. The defense says, you knew he had pulled back the hammer of the gun and not the trigger. She says she doesn't know. Then he asked, do you remember telling Mr. Baldwin, don't worry, we're going to find the source of the live ammunition? She doesn't remember saying that, but doesn't dispute she did. He said, you agree you were involved in the decision to send the firearm to the FBI for testing? And she said, yes. When asked if she remembers being told it could alter the condition of the firearm, she does not remember. After lunch, they're outside the presence of the jury, and they talk about bringing in some evidence about Alec Baldwin being on the phone at the police station with his wife. He's talking about his family still coming to New Mexico that next day. He said they're going to do what they've got to deal with and deal with what they've got to deal with. He's talking about the investigators and the insurance people. Then Baldwin says, and we shouldn't let, we'll go have, it'll work and we'll have a good time. The prosecution says she wants this to come in because the defense talks about how panicked Alec Baldwin was, but this shows right after the shooting, he was on the phone planning a vacation. He did not know at this point that Miss Hutchins was dead, but knew that she had been shot. The reason his family was coming to New Mexico that next day is because he had a small part in the movie for his daughter. And at one point, he's on FaceTime with his wife and then speaks to someone who the prosecution said sounds like a nanny. Baldwin is explaining to that person they need to convince his wife to still come to New Mexico because they can't get their money back for the plane tickets. The defense says there's some additional hearsay, including his wife and the other female speaker. The defense says that the risk in allowing this in is it could make the jury think he didn't care about Miss Hutchins, and that's not the case. He also talks about keeping his family out of the public and away from media during this time. The judge rules the defense made some of this irrelevant issue with Officer LaFleur, the first witness yesterday, and some of that will be allowed in. Another part the state wanted to come in was an interview that Baldwin did where he talks about weapons and his knowledge of weapons, and some of that will also be able to come in. So let's get back to Cross after lunch. She took Baldwin's clothes to test them for blood, and she does admit he was upset at the time. 
He told her he turned and pulled the hammer back, but did not say he pulled the trigger. He shows that paper again that was found in Miss Hutchins' bag and reiterates it says Russ is to macro on hammer as thumb cocks it. Again, throws up the other part of the script that says Russ Colt cocked quietly now. He says you sent the gun off not to have the hammer tested, but to have it destroyed. She said it went off for DNA and other testing. The defense says you tried to find the source of the lethal ammunition and you worked with Corporal Hancock. This next part was very interesting to me. The defense says after Hannah's trial, an individual came into the police station and stated they had 40 rounds of ammunition and turned it in. The defense said the person who went to the police station said this is the ammunition that ended up with Seth Kinney. She says she does not recall. She's asked who she told about this person coming in, and she said her lieutenant and Detective Hancock. The defense says that that was not vouchered and turned over to the defense. She said she was told by her lieutenant to create a report on it. The defense points out that this person who came in was a police officer from a neighboring county, and that this ammunition was said to have been from the rust set. This person offered to fill out a witness statement. The witness said she did not know of any of this. They asked, did you take the rounds, which were Starline brass nickel primers? She doesn't recall. The defense says this person came in because he didn't trust law enforcement in this case. She doesn't know. He asked why law enforcement didn't inventory this with the rest of the evidence in the rust case. She said she was told to put this in as a document. And the defense says, you buried it? And she said, no, there is a supplemental report and it was put into evidence. Again, he asked, did you turn it over to the defense? She said it's not her job to turn things over to the defense. He asked if anyone from the sheriff's office told the armorer or her lawyers that this came in after her guilty verdict, the witness doesn't know. He asked if she agrees. The person that came in said Seth told them this was the evidence from the shooting. She doesn't know. When asked again if the man offered to provide a witness statement, she doesn't remember and she doesn't deny it. The defense goes right in here and says law enforcement likely has the matching rounds to the ammunition that killed Miss Hutchins. The witness says, I don't know. The defense says you don't know because you made a document report and did not put it in the rust evidence. When asked if they were sent to the FBI for testing, she said no. On redirect, the prosecution says is Alec Baldwin being charged with involuntary manslaughter for loading the gun? No. The prosecutor says someone has already been tried and convicted for that. She says yes. She's asked if Seth Kinney brought his live ammunition to the police station before the search of the warehouse. Yes. They ask, is there any evidence that Seth Kinney is the source of the live ammunition from the set? She says no. She's asked, is there evidence Hannah Gutierrez Reed is? And the witness says yes through pictures on Hannah's cell phone. The prosecution shows a photo with a box that says 45 long Colt dummies on screen and asked if Hannah admitted to bringing that on set. The witness says yes. The state says the man who came in the police station to bring in the 45 rounds was a good friend of Hannah's dad. Remember, Hannah's dad, legend in the business as an armorer. The witness said the ammunition did not look the same as the live ammo found on set. The prosecution points out that Seth Kinney had ample time to get rid of any live rounds. Then they show a photo of the ammunition box that says, Live Ammo 1883. The state points out this is clearly marked as live ammunition. The prosecution asked if she interviewed anyone who was on set who can say if the portions of the script and the notes that was introduced by the defense about camera shots is relevant, and she did not. She's asked how many guns were taken into evidence, and she thinks 13. They belong to Seth Kinney, both the real and the fake ones. The prosecution asked if Seth was ever on set except for after the shooting when he opened the safe. She says no. She was asked, do you know if Hannah asked to have live ammunition on the movie she worked on with Nicolas Cage prior to working on Rust? And she does not know. She's asked if after the shooting was the revolver unloaded. The witness said it's her understanding that Hannah unloaded it onto the car, including that spent casing. On a recross, the defense says the Good Samaritan asked you in reference to the ammunition he provided and said that that's the one that killed Miss Hutchins. And you said, yes, correct. She does not recall, but does not deny it. Next witness, the gun manufacturer from Italy. Love his accent, y'all. 
I rewound 50 times, could not catch his name, but he works for Pieta Firearms. He's worked in that company since 1995. Basically, his testimony was about quality control in several steps before that firearm is sent to the buyer. They have a very high-tech manufacturing process. And in Italy, by law, they have to send the gun to what's called a proof house to be tested by them. The weapon is a single action, meaning you have to pull the hammer back each time and then pull the trigger to get it to fire. He said that that weapon would not fire without the trigger being pulled and says it was in proper working condition without any problems when it left their place. But of course, he cannot speak to what happened after that. The next witness was Justin Hill, who owns a marketing company an ad agency, and he recruits and manages sales reps. He handles sales and marketing for Pieta Firearms and EMF, which is Early Modern Firearms, which is a firearms importer where Seth Kinney got the Baldwin revolver. He explains it was in the middle of the pandemic and gun manufacturers were back ordered. They told him they had display guns that they used at trade shows that he could purchase. So Seth Kinney did buy that gun, among many others. EMF does inspect the gun for functionality before each trade show. The trigger worked properly, and there was never any indication of any defects. The last witness of the day was Corporal Hancock from the Santa Fe County Sheriff's Office. Back in 2021, when the shooting happened, she was a detective in the Violent Crimes Unit. She got on scene between 2.30 and 3 p.m., and the CAD said accidental shooting. She interviewed Hannah Gutierrez-Reed, David Halls, and Alec Baldwin the day of the shooting. They had two detectives there interviewing people just due to the large amount of people on that set. The prop master was Sarah Zachary. She assisted Hannah and vice versa because of how prop heavy this case was. Just a note, this is not typical on a movie set. Your armor only job is to ensure the safety of the firearms and the ammo on set. Usually they're not flip-flopping between jobs, but this was a low-budget production. And that was happening. She interviewed Sarah Zachary on the day of the shooting and then about a month later, and the same with Hannah. She interviewed Baldwin the day of the shooting. After that, he was out of the state, and he would reach out to her through calls and texts, and he was the one who would initiate most of the contact. Hannah told the witness that she loaded the gun herself, and Hannah said the box of ammo would have been the one she provided to the production. Hannah showed the witness a photo during her interview, and it matched what was on set. The witness had no question about Hannah being the one who introduced the live ammunition on the set. In the interview with Baldwin, he said he did a training session with Hannah, Sarah Zachary, and their assistant, Nicole. She did interview Seth several times. Can't put a number on it, but at least five to 10 and said he was cooperative. She was the one that asked for the search warrant for his business, the PDQ warehouse, as well as the prop truck. They went out a few days before the search warrant on the prop truck on the 27th to secure it and also to put 24-hour surveillance on it. The truck was locked and a crew member had to meet them there to open it. Inside was a firearm safe that had firearms inside. There were firearms outside of the safe. There were tents and chairs and other things in there. That gun safe was about four feet tall and about a foot wide. Seth Kinney had to come unlock the safe. Hannah's father, Thel Reed, told her about that green ammo can at Seth Kinney's warehouse that had the live ammunition. That information was part of the reason she obtained the search warrant. Thel Reed thought the ammo at PDQ was the same as the ones on the set of Rust, but according to the witness, that turned out not to be true. They did send it to the FBI for testing, even though visually it did not look the same as the live ammunition on the Rust set. She said there was never any proof Seth Kinney provided the ammunition to the set of Rust or was present on that set until the search warrant on the truck. And that was it for today. There was a lot of arguments outside the presence of the jury that took up some time. Tomorrow, again, Hannah Gutierrez-Reed will be there. We don't expect her to testify. In fact, her lawyer has given statements to the press that she will use her Fifth Amendment right. Tomorrow, Corporal Hancock still on direct, and we'll see if she finishes up. This could be a very lengthy witness. She was in the previous trial of Hannah's, and I think the defense is going to go very hard on her, uh, like they did today for Miss Popple, who was on the stand probably three-quarters of the day. All right, that's it, guys. Hope you have a good rest of your evening. We will see you tomorrow.